then of course the refresh. I thank those of you that were here Wednesday evening and um, we simply did the refresh of what we had done Sunday morning a week ago. But I just want to pose a, uh, and actually, I'm, I'm actually close to finishing today. Um, if I don't, Rolf might throw something at me, so I'm going to um, stay the course. But I want you to think about this final subject, um, be Christ-like. And, and I hope that this, this uh, verse from Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 to, I hope that it will be something that will stick with us for the, uh, I'm going to say, the unforeseeable future for as long as we are able to, to cling to, these, to this thought and this idea of being considerate of one another. Be considerate of one another. And I pose these questions to you for just for yourself in a self-assessment one, do I think of others more than myself? Do I think of others more than myself? Two, do I think of God's will more than my will? Do I think of God's will more than mine? Three, do I think of ways to stir up love and good works as the writer of Hebrews is saying to us to do? Do I do that? Do I think of ways to stir up love and good works? Do I deny myself and bear the burdens of other people? And lastly, one that certainly I'm sure most of us have held on to from our youth up to now. Do I live by the golden rule? Do I do unto others as I would have them or would want them to do to me? We read a text from Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4. And the question from that text is, what enables you to be able to count others more significant than yourself. And the writer in the book of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4 tells us the answer to that question is humility. Humility. James chapter 1 and verse 15 we read and discussed briefly last week. What do small sins give birth to when fully grown? And James tells us the answer to that simply is death. Small sins give birth to death when those small sins are fueled and fed and allowed to grow. And James says when these small sins give birth when fully grown to death. And I think probably we ended with this thought one from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1. What did Paul, or rather whom, did Paul imitate to become a new man? Remember we said, Paul said, follow me because I follow Christ. So Paul imitated Christ, and he gives us that same um, uh, path and, and idea to follow. When we ended last week, and I won't go, I don't think I did. Yeah, we did. Um, we talked about drawing near um, to Jesus. There were two preconditions that Paul gave us for becoming considerate, and rather let me backtrack because we don't know the exact writer of the book of Hebrews, but the writer gave us two preconditions for becoming considerate. Out of Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 19 through 25, when we read those verses last week. But this is what he said. He said, those two preconditions of this, he says, let us draw near. And then he followed that up with saying, not only let us draw near, but he said, let us hold fast to that. 
And those are the preconditions that he gave for becoming a considerate person. We end it at this point where we'll pick up the motivation. Consider one another, be Christ-like. The motivation for this is plain. Jesus said, whoever will save his life will lose it. But whoever will lose his life will save it. And if anyone understood the, the, the meaning of these words, it was Saul of Tarsus. We know that Saul went from being the worst to the first. He went from worst to first. Worst enemy of Christ to the leading apostle to the Gentiles. Paul, Saul went from hater and persecutor of Christians to lover and imitator of Jesus Christ. Saul's faith in Christ and love for Christ were the difference makers in his life. And if it can do that for Saul in his transformation to Paul, imagine what it can do for you and I. And, and of all the sins in our life, I don't think we could ever live long enough to equate to becoming the title that Paul really gave himself before the transformation to being the chiefest of sinners. All men have sinned. I don't know if there's another uh, uh, title directed to anyone to be the chief of sinners other than Paul giving it to himself. And if, if the love of Jesus Christ, love in love for Christ, faith in Christ, is the difference for Paul, it can do the same for you and me. According to Jesus, Matthew 25, verse 31 through 36, I won't read all the verses, but in summary, judgment will include a realistic assessment of how considerate you were during your days on earth. The writer of Hebrews concurred with what Jesus said in Matthew 25, 31. The writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, which has been the subject of our discussion for the past quarter plus. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Ralph Waldo Emerson said this. He said, you cannot do a kindness too soon for you never know how soon it will be too late. What do you think Emerson was saying there? Don't put off the opportunity to consider one another. Don't put off the opportunity to love and care about the needs of one another. Because if you put it off, you may not get another opportunity. And that lost opportunity we just say it may catch up with you on the day of judgment. If we lift up Christ and fix our eyes on him, something new and wonderful can happen in our times. Just like Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6, like at, the, uh, like at Pentecost, the blood of Christ and the gospel of peace can bring dying people closer together. As Ephesians 1, 6 says, to the praise of his glorious grace. In times of stress, people are prone to lash out at their neighbors, their mates, their spouses, or brethren, rather than probe their own hearts. And in times of tension, we may search our hearts for a way forward that will please God. Philippians 2, 1 and 2, 
we may search our hearts for a way forward that will please God, that will honor his word and bless our fellow man. When feeling pressured, may we elevate Jesus rather than focus on our differences. Christ said, uh, John chapter 12, verse 32, he said, and I, and we know the song all too well, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, he said, I will draw all people to me. He didn't promise to resolve all of our human differences, but he guaranteed that hearts focused on him will grow, grow closer as a result of our commitment to him. Let us recall Paul's beautiful declaration of the spiritual benefits belonging to those who are in Christ and obedient to him. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 through 10. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth, Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. I summarize the past quarter with this. To promote civility and prepare for eternity, may we lift up our Lord. May we proclaim redemption through his blood. May we declare the riches of his grace. And may we unite all things in him to the praise of his glorious grace. I'll spend the next few minutes going back over something that we started last week and had touched on in the previous weeks, to be mindful. Be mindful from this day forward. God's answer to incivility, we've made it clear, is to consider one another. Awareness of others, awareness of their presence, awareness of their feelings, awareness of their needs, this is fundamental to civility in society and to Christ-likeness in your soul. We said this before, before you can love others, you must see them, you must notice them. You see, sin comes from overlooking others. Sin comes from overlooking their presence. Sin comes from overlooking their pain. And those who ignore or abuse people displease God, who made all of us in his image. The Lord filled the Bible with admonitions to be mindful of others. And it is striking how many one another passages there are in God's word. Citizens of heaven, according to Philippians 2.5, citizens of heaven possess a mindset that distinguishes us from, from them as God's children, from the world as God's children. And as we meditate on these passages and faithfully practice them, you will increasingly resemble the Lord himself. Heaven's antidote to rudeness is simple. Follow Jesus. The more you walk in his footsteps, the more thoughtful 
you are. The more thoughtful you are, the kinder you become. And the kinder you become, uh, the more heaven comes to earth. Jude 2 says, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you and through you. Well, how do we do that? We bear with one another. I'll share a few verses, and if you just want to jot the, the verse, uh, uh, the book uh, uh, title and, and verse locations, that's fine. The first one, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 2. Ephesians 4 and 2 says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Consider one another, be mindful, encourage one another. How? 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you're doing. Encourage one another. How? Hebrews 10.25, following our, our text, Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We don't stop. We continue to encourage one another. Consider one another. Be mindful. How? Greet one another. Romans chapter 16, verse 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Greet one another. How? 1 Corinthians 16, 20. All the brothers send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. 2 Corinthians 13, 12. Greet one another with a holy kiss. 1 Peter 5, 14. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Be mindful how love one another. A new commandment from John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you you also are to love one another. And, and the kind of love that, that's being talked about here is not a kind of sort of love, not a pretend love, not a facade, but the genuine Christ-like love. That's how we ought to love one another. John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. A challenge to us. Love one another so much that everybody looks around and wants to make sure that they're keeping up with that degree of love that we ought to have for one another. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Have, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, 
love one another earnestly from a pure heart. That's how we ought to do it. 1 John 3 and 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Staying in 1 John 3 and moving down to verse 23. And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he has commanded us. 1 John 4 verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Be mindful. Be mindful. First John 4 and verse 12 tells us that no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. What are we showing others through us to be the image and reflection and glory of God? Second John chapter 1 and verse 5. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning that we love one another. There are also some negative one another passages. James chapter 4, verse 11. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against his brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. James 4, 11. Romans 14, verse 13. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, he says, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I'm glad that there's not a whole list of negative verses, if you would, uh, negative one another passages, but here's a couple of miscellaneous uh, ones, and we'll close out after this. John 13 and 14. If I, then your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. John 13, 14. Romans 12, 16 tells us, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight, but live in harmony with one another. Romans chapter 15, verse 7. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Galatians 5, 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Ephesians 4 and 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Ephesians 5, 19. 
addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Ephesians 5, 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms with thankfulness in your heart to God. Colossians 3, 16. Hebrews 3, 13. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. First Peter 4, 9. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling or complaining. Be considerate of one another. First Peter 5, 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. First John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Love is the greatest command, yet what is love? But kindness that stems from thoughtfulness. I cannot love you without first thinking of you. That is why consideration is the foundation of love and the basis of all the good you will do in your lifetime. How can we save souls if we do not care enough to comfort their hearts? How can we save souls if we do not care about your humanity? Why should I concern myself with your eternity? We've come full circle, and I end with this verse, which is where we started. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider one another how to stir up love and good works. That concludes our series on be considerate of one another. Question, comments? I would think after all this encouragement of love that we'd be wiping perspiration. From. It is a little nippy, but it's not as nippy as it was, what, two Sundays ago? I think the thermostats, the computerized thermostats had a mind of their own and would not let us override them. Sometimes we need to go back to old school, don't we? Okay. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed this and I've certainly appreciated your participation and, and your comments. Um, yes. Absolutely. We do these things, but we just don't have the consciousness that we're doing it. And with this, the hope is that we be more conscious about it. And actually, I actually missed my closing thought. David, thank you for that. And I actually highlighted it in orange, and this is what it says. 
how do you, including me, you out there who are watching us uh, either on Facebook or YouTube, how do you increase empathy on the earth? Simple answer. One thoughtful person act of kindness at a time. Just one. I often say to people who have challenges in their life that are overwhelming, and I say, what is the best way to eat the elephant that is blocking your path to getting where you need to be? You can't shove him out the way. To make it easier, it's a chocolate elephant. How do you get him out the way, y'all? One bite at a time. How do you increase empathy on the earth? How do you show more civility on the earth? One thoughtful act or person at a time. Rolf, how much time do we have left for you? Hmm, a little bit? Okay. Uh, if you're ready to start your intro, Rolf, then the floor belongs to Rolf McDaniel. Thank you all. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm not really ready to start, but let me give a crack at it. Lisa, Dennis, whoever's back there, can you bring up, um, there we go, man, they are quick, okay. Um, don't have my notes with me, and I wasn't sure what Melvin's timing would be this morning, but uh, next Sunday morning we will uh, begin a, are you going to bring me one of those, Lisa? Okay, <laughs> see if I can stumble through it. Um, we finish at 12.15, don't we, I think? So we've got a little time left. I don't know if y'all are aware of this or not. I just realized this. It's the first time I've been up here since we had that big clock right in the back there, okay? It actually tells us exactly what time it is. So, uh, okay. Do I need this one up here, Lisa, if I'm going to be turning these slides? Uh, Ma'am? Okay, all right. All right, so I go through this one at a time, okay? And I was prepared to say this. Uh, oh, i got to stand right next to the mic. By the way, we'll have to have the uh, lapel mic for next week because those of you who have watched me teach before know I don't stand still. So, uh, so I'll need the lapel mic. But I'll try to stand still right in front of this, uh, this mic uh, this morning. Again, don't have my notes with me. Wasn't sure exactly when Melbourne would finish this morning, but let's take a crack at it. Next... Um, Sunday morning, we'll begin a lesson um, in Proverbs. And this is in my notes uh, for next week, so I'll probably repeat it again. For years, uh, literally years, I have wanted to teach uh, a series from the book of Proverbs. Actually, I've wanted to teach uh, the book of Proverbs and the book of Psalms. But quite frank frankly, I couldn't figure out how to do it. Uh, neither Proverbs nor Psalms, and we're going to be considered... Um, the Proverbs and the Book of Psalms, uh, and we're going to be considering Psalms, uh, excuse me, Proverbs, um, lends itself very well to an expository study. And I think I'm using the right word. I think expository means verse by verse. I believe it does. And the Book of Proverbs does not lend itself very well to a verse by verse study. Uh, there's a lot of one-liners in the Book of Proverbs, if you will, a lot of statements about wisdom. That's really what the Book of Proverbs is essentially about. Um, uh, there's very little in paragraph form or narrative form. So again, it doesn't lend itself well to uh, a verse-by-verse -verse study at all. It's hard to um, put together a study, I think, from the book of Proverbs. I'll just ask anyone in the audience. Um, many of you have been in the church for a long, long time. You've, of course, heard many times verses quoted from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs this, Proverbs that, Proverbs 
on and on, particular verses. I'll ask you, have you ever sit, sat in a study on the book of Proverbs? Anyone? Well, I haven't either. I've been in the church for 50 years. And to the best of my knowledge, I do not ever remember sitting in a study on the book of Proverbs. And I think it's because of the things that I just did, said, that it doesn't lend itself, it lends itself very well to quoting certain verses that teach us things, that teach us wisdom about things, that teach us God's wisdom about things. But it doesn't lend itself very well to a 13 or 15 or 18 or 20 week um, study. But recently, actually about a year ago, I came across a book written by Brother Tommy South. Uh, Tommy, Brother South, of course, has spoken here many times through the years. He's the preacher now for the Glen Allen Church of Christ. Um, Tommy is a, a remarkable speaker, uh, just a talented speaker. Uh, he's also a talented writer. I've used his books. This is probably a third of his books that I've used in teachings at least a third, it might be the fourth uh, of his books that I've used in teaching classes. The Lord's blessed him with the ability to write very well. He's used that ability as he should have. Um, and Tommy uh, recently wrote a book on, on the book of Proverbs. Uh, so I was able to get that. I've read through that and I said, okay, I think this is it. This is how I can teach the book of Proverbs. Um, the, and we're going to title the series this, if I can do this. By the way, I was prepared to say this next week. This will be my second time uh, using these things right here, so it'll take me a little while to get used to one of these tablets or whatever, but maybe over time I can. Um, uh, and you can see it right there. I must have, I didn't really mean to hit it, but evidently I hit it. We're going to title the series, uh, Don't Be Dumb. Okay? That's going to be the title of our series, all right? Did I offend anybody already? Okay, all right. Well, maybe not, but I think that in our politically correct world, in our sensitive world today, uh, uh, in our sensitive culture of today, where you have to be careful about every single word you say or you're likely to offend someone, I imagine I would offend someone by this title right here, Don't Be Dumb. Well, essentially, brethren, that's what the book of Proverbs is about, Okay as it addresses those of us who are followers of the one and only God, the creator of all things, as it addresses those of us who are Christians, it is addressing us not in a, it does there's no verse, do not misunderstand what I'm saying, there's no verse in Proverbs that says, don't be dumb, okay? At least I don't believe there is. There are a couple verses that are close, I can tell you that, okay? Saying, don't be foolish. Matter of fact, What's, what's someone who is named in the book of Proverbs? One of the characters of the book of Proverbs. Our second lesson will be, not the first lesson, the first lesson will be this introduction, which I'm beginning right now, um, and we'll have to repeat it again next week. But, what, but uh, the second lesson will be about the list of characters in the book of Proverbs. And there's one character in Proverbs that has to do with don't be dumb. Can anybody tell me who it is? Yes, sir. Exactly, okay? <laughs> In that book of Proverbs over and over again, it addresses the fool, okay? And it says don't be a fool, okay? In other words, don't be dumb, okay? Now again, I'll repeat this again next week, but uh, and over and over again in, in my study, and let's uh, see, I told you I'd walk away from that microphone, okay? I can't stand still and teach, all right? The, um, um, over and over again in our study, I'll ask you not to be offended because we're going to say, don't be dumb, okay? All right? In other words, show some wisdom, all right? Because, again, that's what the book of Proverbs is about, all right? Uh, the next slide says, the wisdom of Proverbs for today. Um, a gentleman by the name of Hal David. I actually think it was Hal David and Burke Bacharach. Okay, now there are some people sitting in the audience this morning that are as old as I am. I'm looking at you, okay? All right? And if you're not as old as I am, you're pretty close to my age. So let's see who knows who Hal David and Burke Bacharach were, okay? Anybody? 
know who Hal, David, and Bert Backrack were? Uh, not exactly musicians, okay? Well, they might have been musicians, but that's not really what they were famous for. Kyle, you should know. They were songwriters. That's exactly right. They were songwriters out of the 60s primarily. Now, they might have been 50s, 60s, 70s. I'm sure they continued the 70s and 80s. Kyle probably knows more than that than I do. In my personal opinion, there hasn't been any music made after December 31st of 1969, but that's just my opinion. Okay, all right. And uh, the, uh, uh, But Hal David and Bert Backrack, you liked that one, did you, Dave? Okay, all right, okay. Hal David and Bert Backrack uh, wrote a song entitled... What the world needs now is love. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. That's the only thing that there's just too little love. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, excuse me? Now we know why I didn't lead a song this morning. That's exactly right. All right, I got another question for you, okay? Uh, yeah, that song was Bert, wrote by Hal David and Burt Backrack. By the way, Hal David and Burt Backrack wrote a lot of the songs uh, for Dionne Warwick, just in case you're interested, okay? All right. But Dionne Warwick didn't record What the World Needs Now. It's love, sweet love. So those of you who are as old as I am and who lived through the 50s and 60s, tell me who originally sang What the World Needs Now is love. Huh? Margaret, were you going to give me a guess? Anybody tell me who? Cal. I, I, I only you only own Dion's version, okay? Well, it was originally done by a lady by the name of Jackie DeShannon, okay? All right, okay, all right. Uh, now you know, many of you know my love for uh, the music of my youth or whatever, okay? And the history of the music of my youth. So, Hal David and Burt Backrack wrote this song, first recorded by Jackie DeShannon, called What the World Needs Now is Love. Well, there is no doubt that the world does not, as a matter of fact, that's what Melvin just finished uh, t talking about, okay, for, for many weeks, you know, consider one another, okay, and, um, and, and show love and concern and graciousness and kindness and uh, mercy and all of these things that he talked about over this time. And uh, as David said, that if we treat people like that, we'll find out that they'll treat us often in the same way back. Maybe not all the time, but oftentimes, okay? Um, well, so there's no doubt that the world doesn't need more love, no doubt about it, okay? Uh, but I would submit to you that the world needs more um, than just love. It certainly needs that, okay? What the world needs now in addition to love, at least it's in addition to love, perhaps more than love, I don't know, we could debate that, okay? Uh, I would say to you that what the world needs now is wisdom, okay? But it's more than that. The world does not just need man's wisdom. Quite frankly today, we're getting enough of, quote, man's wisdom, as a matter of fact, we're getting too much of man's wisdom, all right? Uh, because the scriptures say, it is not in man that walketh to what? Someone? Okay. Exactly. To guide his own footsteps, to direct his own footsteps. It is not in man that walketh. Sorry, I don't remember where that passage comes from right now, but it's not in man that walketh to direct his own steps or to guide his own steps, as Gary just told us. Okay? All right? Um, if that's true, what the world doesn't need is man's wisdom. What the world needs is God's wisdom. Okay? And that's what we're going to be studying from the book of Proverbs, God's wisdom, okay? Uh, you know, this is in my notes, and I don't remember all of it, but just think for a moment. I, you, you know, I've still got some time here. Just think for a moment. It, it's amazing to me, startling to me, uh, disappointing to me, uh, angering to me at times, um, 
how foolish some of the world's teachings are, just how purely ignorant some of the world's teachings are. And I'm sorry, I know that's a word I shouldn't use, okay? But I want you to think about some of the teachings of the world right now. Quite frankly, and I am going off the cuff right now, okay? Quite frankly, some of which is being taught in our public schools. And I am not, I'm not in any way accusing any of our teachers who are members here or who are Christians of teaching this, but the concepts, and sometimes they're backed into a corner and almost forced to teach it, and the concepts that are taught, the concepts that are taught about <sighs> sexual things, the concepts that are taught about gender. Have you not read, brethren, that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? That's the wisdom. That's some wisdom right there that the, lo that the world needs. The things I read about some of the things that are taught by gender, uh, that again, and I'm... Since I don't have my notes in front of me, I'm way off the cuff here, okay? All right? Um, that I'm not supposed to call David a he or use the pronouns he or him when I'm speaking of David. That I'm not supposed to use the pronouns her or she when I'm talking about Pam. Come on, people. We think that's wisdom, we think that's intelligence. We think that's brilliant? We think that makes any sense? This is ignorance, brethren. Espoused by some of the brightest people in the world, supposedly. Teaching this kind, I'm going to be a little stronger, this kind of stupidity, this kind of ignorance. I guess I'm making my point. What the world needs now, it needs love, but it also needs wisdom. And it does not need the kind of wisdom we were just speaking of, which is not wisdom at all. It needs God's wisdom, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Let's look at some of the lessons we're going to be looking at, okay? I uh, kind of go by one, you know, just our table of contents for the next Ever long it takes us. You know, Melvin and uh, Jamie and I have decided that uh, because we're the three teachers of this auditorium class now that when we teach classes, we're going to kind of go until we finish or whatever, okay? Because there's only three of us, so we're going to kind of go till we finish. So I'm not sure whether this will be 13 weeks, 15 weeks, 18 weeks, or 20 weeks. But we're going to spend some time studying the book of Proverbs, okay? All right, okay? All right. Uh, so our table of contents, we'll be looking at lessons like this. What are the Proverbs and why do we need them? You know, that'll be part of our introductory lesson this morning. Uh, the, uh, and then we'll have a second lesson. And I'm going to love this one. I'm going to love them all. Well, no, the second lesson I already told you. Proverbs cast of characters. All right. It's really, really interesting in the book of Proverbs that there is a cast of characters. By the way, who wrote the book of Proverbs? Solomon. Solomon. Was he the only one? No, he really wasn't. We think of Solomon, we think of Proverbs as written by Solomon, and that's correct. Many and perhaps most of the of the book of Proverbs was written, written by Solomon, but not all of it was written by Solomon. Okay? There are other authors to the book of, of Proverbs, and we'll talk about that, okay? And in talking about that, we will list this cast of characters that kind of gives the the Proverbs, and I'm not going to remember of all of them. One of them I've already told you is the fool. Can any of you think of an, other characters that are named in the book of Proverbs? Other characters, both positives and negative. There's some, you know, some characters that we would consider positive uh, uh, delineations or names for these folks, and then some negative ones. I mean, you know, fool is not a positive thing, okay? All right. Excuse me? Exactly. Wise man, or even wisdom itself, David. One of the characters of the book of Solomon is wisdom. By the way, we will talk about that. You ladies are going to like this. Wisdom is designated as a she. 
in the book of Solomon. Excuse me, in the book of Proverbs. All right? You see, uh, there are many in the outside world that are say we Christians are um, uh, negative toward ladies. That Christianity is negative toward ladies. That the scriptures are even negative toward, um, toward women. All right? Well, that's interesting because in the book of Proverbs, wisdom is cast as a she. All right? Other words, though, okay, the wise man or wisdom, fool, can you name of any others? Jealousy. Excuse me? Was it jealousy? I don't think that's named as a character. That's going to be certainly something that's discussed, Gary, in the book of Proverbs, but I, to my knowledge, that's not one of the characters, okay? Well, I, right in front of you today, I'm not going to remember the whole list of characters. They're in my notes. They'll come up when we get to this second lesson, uh, lesson about the cast of characters. But uh, one is the sluggard. Do you remember that? Sluggard. S-L-U-G-G-A-R-D. Sluggard. All right? That's not a positive term for anybody. But the sluggard, I didn't say he was named possibly, but he is part of the cast of characters in the book of Proverbs. I'll give you another one. The adulterous woman is part of the cast of characters in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs was generally written for the young. Now, I'm going to get myself in deep trouble with the next thing I'm going to say. Okay, really, really deep trouble. Please bear with me and know that I mean this in the right way, okay? As I look upon our audience this morning, okay, <laughs> the, uh, it, was, it was really written to, in some ways, I wish that, uh, that the, the, these young couples and young singles that are back here in this young person's class would be in this class, that we've started would be in this class. Because that's primarily who Proverbs is written to. But do not uh, misunderstand. And... There might to be two or three or four this morning, <laughs> this morning's class that we might classify that area. Again, this is where I'm getting myself in trouble, but maybe not. But I promise you, brethren, the age of every one of us, and I'm going to be one of the oldest ones, okay? I'm going to be one of the oldest ones. I promise you, and with the work I've already done in putting together these lessons speaks to this old guy. So I think it'll speak to all of us, okay? All right. Um, but the adult, uh, and but my point was, the young man is cautioned over and over again to be careful of the adulterous woman. Okay. Now, ladies, I think that lends itself to the young lady being careful of the adulterous man too. But the adulterous woman is a character in the book of Proverbs. Okay. Let's keep going. Okay. Let's see if we can finish up. I only have five minutes. Maybe we can get through the lessons we're going to consider in there. Don't be dumb about God. This is the one I was going to tell you. I would really love teaching this one, this particular lesson. Uh, I've said over and over again, those of you who have said in my lessons know this, how uh, deep an interest I have in Christian evidences, Christian apologetics, and so forth, and the evidence that we have that there is a God, the evidence that we have that there was a man named Christ who walked this earth, evidence both in the scriptures and outside the scriptures, the evidence even outside the scriptures that this man Christ was crucified on the cross, evidence outside the scriptures, the evidence that we have that our scriptures are indeed the inspired word of God, both inside the scriptures and outside the scriptures. The evidence is remarkable and abundant. So I will really be excited in particular about don't be dumb about God. In other words, don't be dumb in thinking that it's not a God. By the way, that's one of the Proverbs. The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. Okay? All right? So we'll get to that. Let me see if I can finish up at least of these, okay? Don't be dumb about self-control. Wow. I'm 75 years old. At least I will be next week. And I just talked about teaching to the young. Old Rolf still needs to know about self-control. I don't know about you, but I still need to learn that. I'm a lot better than I was 40 years ago, but I still got a ways to go. So it applies to all of us, all right? All right, here we go, okay? Don't be dumb about adultery. Well, we'll meet this adulterous woman, okay? Don't be dumb about God's teachings about sexual relations and where they belong, okay? Um, don't be dumb about drinking, and we could add to that 
other things that bring uh, substance abuse in. Don't be dumb about work. Don't be dumb in thinking that you're not supposed to work. Don't be dumb in thinking about work's all you're supposed to do. All right? The Proverbs will address that. Let's see what else. Don't be dumb about friends. Don't be dumb about the relationships that we have in life. Some that will be positive for us, some that can be tremendously negative to us. So we'll talk about that and what the Proverbs say, okay? Don't be dumb about choosing a mate. I haven't got to this one yet, putting it together. I'll be honest with you, I thought about it. And, and I'm just being honest again. Does, in, in this class, as I look out among the audience, will it apply? Uh, well, I'm going to tell you, yeah, I think it applies. Because we still need to think about those things. Those of us who are older and those of us who maybe have married for 50 years, like the wife and I will be this coming August, as we have the opportunity to teach someone else and caution someone else. We're going to run out of time. Let's see what else we've got here. Okay. Um, and then we'll talk about Proverbs in the New Testament. Let's go to this one and finish with this one. All right. Notice this verse, Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharp, sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. Okay. So we know that we can take two pieces of iron or two pieces of metal, and as we rub, rub them together, both of them become sharper, do they not? By the way, this is a perfect example of what a proverb is, a short, pithy saying that teaches tremendous, um, that teaches great wisdom. Um, we know we can take two pieces of metal or two pieces of iron and rub them together, and both of them become sharper, right? All right? Well, as we study the Word of God, and particularly this over this next few months, okay, as we study Proverbs, we will find that God will sharpen us, but then it becomes our responsibility to sharpen someone else. As iron sharpens iron, one man has or one woman has the opportunity to sharpen someone else and help someone else develop a greater wisdom. Look forward to starting next week. Thank you. <clears throat>